Well, I invite you to have your Bibles open tonight to John chapter 1. Um, I know you've studied it all week. I know you just got done discussing it. And I, so I, I'm not trying to suggest that you don't know what's there. I'm going to try and package it maybe in a little different way tonight than m- maybe you've uh, done before. So most, uh, most com- commentators... When they work through an outline of the book of John, they usually say there's a prologue, an introduction section. And that prologue usually is identified as chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. So if you have your Bibles open, just sort of get a look. I'm going to scroll, but I hesitate to scroll too much because it makes people dizzy. Um, So 1 through 18, uh, you've got uh, the opening five verses, you've got Uh, The second section, talking about John the Baptist a little bit, and then you're back to the Word, and you finish there. So when it slips into, this is the testimony of John in verse 19, most commentators would say we're now entering into, out of the prologue, into uh, the first portion of the book. I'm going to suggest that we, (laughs) surprise, surprise, I'm going to suggest we maybe look at this a little differently tonight. And this is, uh, as I was studying and knowing some of the things that I uh, picked up on in some of my uh, more recent classes even, um, I was just going to propose to you. One of the things that we need to understand, though, before we go even to the text, is just uh, this idea that John spent some time in the city of Ephesus. It may seem like it's out of left field, but trust me, I'm going to tie it all back in together. John spent some time in the city of Ephesus. It's not exactly clear when and how long and what years he arrived, and, but uh, it's potential that uh, even before he went into his exile on Patmos and then after exile on Patmos, there's a church tradition that he took uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, with him to Ephesus. And at least one vein of the tradition says that Mary and John are both buried there in that city. Okay? Ephesus was a port city. It was a huge city. Uh, I had the benefit of going and seeing some of the archaeological digs that they're doing there now, and they estimate they, they've only unearthed a fraction, and it was by far the biggest archaeological dig site that I've been to, and I've been to a, a couple, right? So, um, as, as a bit of underpinning and some background, we just need to understand that. So, as we dive into chapter 1, I don't know if you noticed, but this first chapter, it's full of stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's deep stuff, too. But it seemed kind of fractured to me. I don't know if you noticed that as you read through it. It seems like we're kind of jumping all over the place. I mean, uh, here are my notes. I just said, uh, you know, these first five verses seem pretty deep. Seems like we're getting into something, maybe way over my head, but okay, we're getting into it at least. And then verse five ends, and then all of a sudden we're talking about John the Baptist. It's sort of like we take a, a right turn. And then we get through those uh, verses, and um, we get down to verse 14, and then it goes back into the word became flesh, and it seems like we're kind of picking up where verse 5 left off, right? Because the word was tied back into it, and so I feel like I maybe know where this is going, but right after that, what happens? We go back into this discussion about John the Baptist, and how John the Baptist testified about this, and then we start gathering disciples together, And it just seems like a whole lot is going on, and there's a lot of it that's kind of focused on John the Baptist. A lot of it's about Jesus, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of discussion in chapter 1 about John the Baptist and what his claims were and who he was and who he wasn't. Okay, we'll get to that in a little bit. I'd like to suggest to you that chapter 1 could be viewed as John's invitation, his invitation to his readership, which begs a question, right? Who's John trying to get to read his gospel? Well, besides everybody, right? Because that's, that's a good answer. Everybody needs to read it. Um, there were, I, I've identified four different sections of people or categories of people that I believe John had in his mind as he was formulating this gospel. And then uh, I'll give you these four. And then I'll, we'll go through each of the four individually and I'll try and back up my, uh, my idea. Uh, right out of chapter 1, and then um, we'll take a vote at the end, see how he did. 
No, we are not taking a vote. Uh, first, uh, probably the most obvious would be John's wanting Jewish people to connect and be, feel invited by this first chapter. When a Jewish reader reads this first chapter, what John wants is for them to have a longing to dive into the rest because their interest has been perked. It's been like, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to know more about that concept. So Jewish people. Uh, on the flip side of that, uh, you have Gentiles. And John knows that the Gentile audience needs to be reached because he spent a lot of time in Ephesus, a Gentile port city, right? And so uh, he wants the introduction of his book, the first little bit, to pique the interest of the Gentile audience as well. A third category, kind of a subset, would be Jewish people that are Hellenized. And when I say Hellenized, that's a term that means they are probably Greek speaking in their native tongue. So a lot of the Jews that grew up in Israel would learn how to speak either Hebrew or Aramaic, a sister language to Hebrew, and that would be their mother tongue. And they would probably also learn Greek as a second language and maybe some others uh, as trade languages. Uh, but Hellenized Jews are Jews that generally were born and grew up and live away from Israel. And so uh, being out in the Greek world, the Roman world, uh, they would learn how to speak Greek as their mother tongue. These are called Hellenized Jews. But it's not just the language that they pick up, right? What else do you pick up when you live in a, in a world? Yeah, all the customs and all the, the way people think, right? You pick up on all that. So these Hellenized Jews have sort of one foot in the Jewish realm. They understand the Jewish scriptures, but they also have one foot in the Greek realm, which has Greek philosophy and a bunch of different things going on. So those first three, the Jews, the Gentiles, and then the Hellenized Jews. And then this last one's gonna be a really weird one and you probably, uh, it'll be the last one I explain. There's little pockets of followers of John the Baptist that are out there. John the Baptist, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, had, had a big following. And some of those people are still around 30 years after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And they're not quite tuned in to what's going on, but they are tuned in to John the Baptist. And they're still talking about John the Baptist 30 years later. And John, I believe, writes the beginning of his gospel to include that group as well. Okay? I'll try and back that up with some scripture as we go. So let's talk about the Jewish audience first. And let's just start at the beginning of the book. What a better place to start, right? Uh, what, he, what in this first chapter, there's a lot of things that are probably not going to mention just because of time, but what in this first chapter might pique the interest of a Jewish reader? Well, let's just start the book, right? In the beginning. Okay, stop. <laughs> what does that sound like? It sounds just like Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created, right? And in fact... There is a Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And if you went into the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the two Greek words that start that version and the two Greek words that you find here are exactly the same. And it's not by chance, okay? So right off the bat, what he is doing is he is piquing the interest. Oh, in the beginning, I know that story. I'm a Jewish reader. I know my version of that story, the Jewish version, right? So has obvious ties right back in. The next thing I'm going to point out, and again, I'm not pointing out everything, but these are the major ones, is if you skip down past that first John the Baptist section to chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the one uh, only begotten from the Father. Okay? He became flesh. This may be one of those new thoughts, but let's get back into the Jewish culture. He dwelt among us. And those of you that have studied this book before, you may recognize that that word dwelt in the English, if you travel back into the Greek language, it is the word for tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. Tabernacle is a mobile 
non-permanent structure. So it's a non-permanent structure that moves around. And John says, uh, most notably in the Old Testament, right? The tabernacle is built when Moses gets the commands on Mount Sinai. They come down, they build the tabernacle. They use it for the 40 years in the wandering, wandering in the wilderness, right? That tabernacle then goes into the promised land with Joshua, goes through the time of the judges at a place called Shiloh, and eventually David says, I have a really nice house of cedar, but God lives in a tent with curtains. <laughs> that doesn't seem right. So David starts planning to make this mobile structure, this tabernacle, into the permanent structure that becomes the temple. Okay? And that's in the same location that the temple of Jesus Day is. So, verse 14. This word became flesh and tabernacled among us. If I'm a Jewish reader, that's interesting because he goes on to say, and we saw his glory. Well, if you know anything about the Old Testament story about the tabernacle, when it's dedicated, what happens? The glory of the Lord comes and fills the tabernacle. And there's a beam of light shining out of it. A cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? Okay, it's the glory of God. It's the presence, the very presence of God. His glory dwells within the tabernacle. And John is bringing that picture out of the Old Testament and connecting it with Jesus. In the same way that he connected the creation of the universe with Jesus in the first verse. So those are two places. The next is in 129, when John the Baptist says, the next day he saw Jesus, there's the tie to Jesus, coming and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. He's referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God, which, uh, again, if you know your Old Testament, lambs are sacrificial animals in the Old Testament, but there's one story that I'm gonna suggest ties directly to this comment probably more so for a Jewish reader than maybe some of us that don't know the stories as well. There's a story in Genesis chapter 22. It's the story of Isaac being offered by his father, Abraham. It's kind of one of those weird stories. We don't like talking about it because culturally it's like, yeah, this is, this is a weird story. But in this story, Abraham is told to sacrifice his son Isaac, his only, his unique son, which is how he's described, his only son. Even though Abraham actually has another son, it's not through the promise that God had given. And so they go to this place that God shows them, and uh, there's a question that uh, Isaac has. He says in verse 7, where, uh, I've got, we've got the wood and we've got the fire for the offering, but where's the, where's the lamb? And what's the answer? Abraham, pretty quick thinking on his feet, full of faith. God will provide the lamb. Well, I don't know if you ever noticed, but as the story goes, uh, he's about to uh, bring down a knife on his son, and God stops him, by the word of an angel, and said, whoa, stop, whoa. And he looks up, and what does he see? There's a ram caught in the thicket. And they take that ram and they sacrifice it instead of Isaac being sacrificed. And this brings in a concept of substitutionary atonement, right? There's a substitute. You don't have to die here. We'll accept this in your place. So it's a very important story in the Old Testament. But there's a question that's not answered out of that story. What's the question? Where's the lamb that God will provide? Did you notice? The lamb never shows up. But God provides a ram, which is a wholly different animal, still acceptable for sacrifices, but a wholly different animal. So we come out of the Genesis chapter 22 story with this begging question, where's the lamb that God will provide? And I would suggest to you that as we dive back into John chapter 1, specifically verse 29 and again in verse 36, John the Baptist sees Jesus walking and he says, Behold, there he is. There's the lamb that God will provide. 
He says it twice. Later in verse 36, again, he's walking with two of his disciples. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God. I'm suggesting to you this first group of Jewish readers would connect with that statement, probably more so than any of those other groups that I mentioned. Um, Long history of those things. The last thing I'm going to point out for these Jewish readers is the very last sentence. And uh, it has to do with when Nathaniel is called and Nathaniel uh, makes his statement in verse 49, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. He comes to this conclusion based on a conversation. And Jesus said, wow, you, uh, just because I saw you under the fig tree and I mentioned that, that you came to that conclusion. And then he says, you're going to see greater things than this. And what does he say? Say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, I don't know if that uh, rings a bell to any of you, but it comes directly out of an Old Testament passage. And it's the story of Jacob. Jacob, when he leaves his family because he's uh, ticked off his brother (laughs) in more than one way, and he's uh, off to find a bride, right? He, he stops in a place, and he lays down because he's tired, and he puts his head on a rock, and he has a dream. Well, let's, let's go back and take a look at that. It's in Genesis uh, chapter 28. You will notice, by the way, as we go through John, I have a lot of highlights and a lot of notes tacked on to my Logos program, and... Uh, it's because it's spent a lot of time in, in John. And here's one place in the Old Testament that ties to that, and I've highlighted it. Um, so he has a uh, dream in verse 12. And he says, Behold, a ladder was set on the earth, and its top reaching into heaven. We think of it like a fireman's ladder. It's probably not what he saw in, in his dream. It's probably more like a, um, a staircase. Um, probably more like a, what's known in the ancient world as a ziggurat probably what was built for like the Tower of Babel or Babel. It's, a, it's an attempt to build a structure that reaches into the heavens and connects the earthly creation with the unseen realm of God, okay? So these, these happened in the secular realm and it's probably more, more than a fireman's ladder, just kind of perched up in the air, kind of weird. That's what I always envisioned, but. Um, and it says, Behold, there's a ladder set on the earth with its top reaching into heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Right? Do you recognize the connection? This is called Jacob's ladder. And uh, I, have, I have a fun office. I, I've, uh, in the last study, I brought out my uh, artwork of the Last Supper. And I have toys in my office as well. I've got three specific ones that have theological underpinnings. Uh, This one is from the 80s. It's called The Missing Link. And it's an attempt to get these uh, colors and links all. And I've got it actually. I tried to solve it, but I'm one off. I can't get the yellow one over there. And I forgot how to. So I'm just going to set that so you can't see it. Okay. The other one I have is called The Snake. Huh? Yeah. Theologically. Yeah, I hide that one. The third one, though, from my childhood is what's called Jacob's Ladder. Do you remember? Do you ever see this? It's fun because if you turn it uh, this way, you can make it into, I don't know what that is. (laughs) But that's about the only other thing I can do with it. Jacob's Ladder, ascending, mostly just descending, right? Okay. I don't know the history of how it got that name, but that's what it's called, Jacob's Ladder. And as you go into John chapter 1, the very last verse in chapter 1, what does Jesus do with Jacob's ladder? Did you notice? Chapter 1, verse 51, And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, now he slipped into the plural here. These yous in verse 51 are plural. They're singular before then, talking just to Nathaniel. But here, when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's a plural you. So it's not just Nathaniel, it's everybody there with him. I say to you that you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on not a ladder, but the Son of Man. What did Jesus do? He changed the picture in the Old Testament of what is that connection between the earth 
the creation in the unseen realm of the heavens, what is that connection? It's not a ziggurat, it's not a fireman's ladder, it's not a, it's Jesus. Jesus is that connection. And that's what Jesus did with that Old Testament. So these are four things that John included in his chapter one. We're calling it the invitation, right? Because he's trying to get, pique the interest of the people that he wants to read this. And number one was the Jewish crowd. And he, did he do a good job? If I was from, I'm not even from, and I get done and I'm like, wow, that's impressive. What was the second group? The Gentiles. Good. I was just, I was hoping you were listening. I stuck my neck out there and you answered. Thank you. So let's talk about uh, the first line. In the beginning. All the way up. See, I'm making you sick. In the beginning was, and in our translations, it's the what? It's the word which we've said it so many times that it, we, it sounds normal now, but if you really think about that, it, it's kind of a weird concept. In the beginning was the word. Where did this come from? Well, behind it, it's a Greek word that some people think is logos and others pronounce it logos, and it depends on what kind of Greek uh, you took, uh, what your professor told you to say it like. And so I say logos, um, let's talk about this logos. It is a Greek word that at its basis means to speak, okay? The logos, to speak. But that's not just, we can't just land it there. It refers, I'm just going to read from the list here. It refers to word, a word, the word, or words that a speaker says sometimes, okay? It can also be stretched to mean an entire message, not just the words, but the entirety of the words that make a message. It can mean a discourse. It can even mean a, a thought expressed in a discourse. These are other ways that it's used, okay? Logos comes to mean rationale, the rationale behind something. We get our word what from it? We get logic. Do you hear logic in it? Okay, so all of this kind of plays into our understanding of what logic is as well. The rationale behind something, an argument cannot be referred to as a logos. A structure or a pattern, any type of structure, uh, a structure or a pattern, particularly the pattern of a rational thought, how you get from A to B from a rationale, that pattern. Sometimes it just simply refers to reason. And when the word is used in Greek, it reverberates with all of these understandings. It's a very complex word. So let's talk about how logos is used in the Bible. It would just be in the New Testament, right? Because it's Greek. So it's used 330 times in the New Testament. That's quite a bit. Four times to refer to this character, Jesus. So for the majority of its uses, um, it's translated into the appropriate ways. And depending on your English translation, there are between 29, of the 330 times, there are between 29 and 38 different English words that are used when translating the Greek word logos. Kind of suggests some of the complexities. You are reading logos in your English translations and you don't even know you're reading it because it's translated 29 times in some and as many as 38 different, time, different ways in others. So, we're going to go back into the Greek-speaking world. There's a uh, pre-Socratic uh, philosopher by the name of, uh, again, two pronunciations, either Heraclitus or Heraclitus, and I'm going to say Heraclitus. And he was uh, living in 535 to 475 BC. Okay, so we're in the before the New Testament time, but we're kind of after the Old Testament. We're in that in-between time when the Greek philosophers are uh, developing, we get pre-Socratic, and then we go into Socrates and the Socratic and into Plato, and, and it's fully developed in this intertestamental period. Well, Heraclitus is the first to take this Greek term logos and uh, start to give it 
uh, a philosophic meaning. Uh, interesting that he was a native of, guess what town? Ephesus. Yes, he's from Ephesus. So as we go into Ephesus, even uh, after Jesus' time, um, Heraclitus, is, his presence is being felt even then. So listen to some things that Heraclitus does with this idea of the logos, this reason. Um, he is a guy that's known, uh, he thinks of the world as being a world of continual change. He's famous uh, being ascribed to this idea of you can step into a river, but you never step into the same river twice. Even if you're at the same place on the shore, you put your foot in, it's brand new water flowing by. And so it, at one sense, you're stepping into the same river, and in another sense, it's a completely different river, right? That's, he's generally ascribed that thought. Um, so this world is in complete flux and change, but he says it's an organized flux. And what does he say organizes this flux? He's a Greek philosopher, so he doesn't believe in God or the gods, even the Greek gods. But he says it's this idea of the logos, the reason. And he starts developing this. Listen to what he says. The logos is a divine controlling principle of the universe. That's interesting. Another thing. All things happen according to the logos the reason, the organizing structure of the universe, but that people don't understand it. Everything's created through it, but people don't understand it. He considers the Lagos to be responsible for the creation and organi organization of all reality. And the Lagos, it's not material in nature, but it was cre it created and controls the material world. This is Heraclitus coming up with a definition of what the Logos is from a Greek philosophic standpoint. Consider this out of his own words. Though the Logos is, as I have said, men always fail to comprehend it, both before they hear it and when they hear it of, of it the first time. For all things come into being in accordance with this Logos. Those who hear it seem like men without any experience of it. This is how a Greek philosopher is describing how the creation of everything, and he ascribes it to this Greek idea of the logos, the reason that superintends the chaos of the world and puts it into an orderly format. And that began around 500 BC, and then it's further developed as the Socratic philosophers come and interact with that idea, more fully developed and changed and all kinds of things. So how does John open up his gospel? In the beginning was the Logos. What has he already done to his Gentile audience, his Greek audience? All of a sudden, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. And then where does he go with it? Um, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God. Well, they don't really believe in God, but okay, that's, that's an interesting thought. Let's run with it and see what comes next. And the Logos was God. Oh, you mean that thing that we've been discussing in philosophic thought for centuries, you're ascribing that to God himself. Interesting. Logos was God and the log uh, was with God and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him. Well, that makes sense because that's what I think too, right? And as you go through, the light shines in the darkness, but what? The darkness we hear in the darkness, we don't comprehend that Logos at all. That makes sense. I'm piqued. So when John describes Christ as the Logos, he does it in John chapter 1, verse 1, 1, 14. I don't know if you know this, but he also starts 1 John 1, what was from the beginning, what we heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked and touched with our hands concerning the Logos of life. He used it in the beginning of 1 John as well. And he uses it uh, once in Revelation as well. 
So that's the first two. You got your Jews and your Greeks. The last two go a little bit faster. The Hellenized Jews. Well, we're just marrying with the Hellenized Jews. We're just marrying the first two categories. So are the Hellenized Jews going to be interested in this? Yeah, because they're going to connect with everything that the Jewish audience is going to connect with. And they're also going to be very familiar with this idea of the Greek philosopher uh, that they've promoted of the Logos. Hellenized Jews were on board after just chapter one. I want to read the rest of this thing. Okay? Now, we get to that weird pocket of John the Baptist followers. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, it's, uh, it seems like a jumbled bit of mess because we start really strong in the first five verses and then we go into John the Baptist. And let's just look at what it says in uh, verse six. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, we go through this big thing and John says he's not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And so he's defining who he is and who he's not. Okay, clearing up some distinctions there. And then we get back into, remember verse 14, where we're back to the word becoming flesh, okay, and dwelling among us. We've covered that. But then, verse 15, John testified about him and cried out, saying. So now we're back to John clarifying who, who he is in relation to this word character, Jesus. And then we get into the testimony of John. When the Jews come and the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem and they ask him, who are you? Are you this Old Testament character or that Old Testament character or this one or that one? Who are you? And he says, I'm not any of them. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not who people are thinking I am. I'm just here to usher that one in. So I'm not, let's clarify, I'm not any of those. And then we get the next day in verse 29, he goes on to describe uh, the Lamb of God, and we get into the next day in verse 35 where some of his disciples, and he's shoving his disciples. We get to see him shoving his disciples off onto this one that follows him, the one that he is the light. The, the, he's giving them over to the light. Okay? There seems to be, coming out of this chapter 1, just a, a real big clarification of who John is in relation to Jesus. And it kind of gets lost when you focus on all the other stuff because there's plenty of other stuff to focus on about who Jesus is, right? But there's a huge section of it seemingly devoted to John. Well, let's just talk about John a little bit. We don't know exactly how long John the Baptist's ministry lasted. I did some Google searching. As few as a few months, some people estimate, and some people estimate as long as five or six years. I think five or six years is outside of the realm I'm comfortable with. I think a few months is inside of, outside of the realm I'm comfortable with as well. It seems to me as we read the Gospels that there is a momentum that John the Baptist creates that get behind him. He has time to have disciples created. He has several disciples following him and studying him, right? Studying his words. Uh, just uh, briefly, in Matthew 3, verse 5, all of Jerusalem is going out to him. All of Judea, the, dis the district around the Jordan, they're confessing their sins, they're being baptized. In Mark 1, Mark begins with John the Baptist, and he says in verse 5, all the country of Judea was going out to him, all the people of Jerusalem. Now, was it all the people? I mean, was it every single person? No, but this is, a, this is an all-inclusive there was the majority, if not a supermajority, of the people going out to him, okay? Um, all types of people, you might say. Sections from every group we see. We see Pharisees and Sadducees coming out, and he's surprised. Who, who told you to come out here, right? Uh, in Luke 3, uh, so he began saying to the crowds, you brood of vipers. He's a very pleasant guy. <laughs> he knows how to get a crowd on his side, therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And, you know, there's a back and forth, and indeed the axe is already laid at the root of the tree. Wow. And people still go out. There's something that he is saying that catches traction, right? People are going out and confessing their sins. People are asking, 
The crowds are asking, what should we do? And he answers, hey, share your tunic. <laughs> You've got to buy a tunic first, right? <laughs> Tax collectors come, what should we do? Be fair in how you collect your taxes. Soldiers come out, and what about us? Don't take any money from anybody by force. He's giving advice to all different kinds of groups. All of the nation is coming out to him. And now look at what verse 15 in Luke 3 says. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation, you need to know, coming out of the book of Daniel, there's a prophecy in Daniel that says, starting at the time when Zerubbabel comes back and starts to rebuild the temple, there's a decree given. Starting at the time of that decree to rebuild the temple, you can count off a certain number of years and expect the Messiah to be showing up soon. It's, Jesus' ministry fits within that Daniel time frame. But so does John the Baptist. He shows up at the same time and he's first. So when he shows up and he says, I don't know if you noticed, but he's saying things like Jesus ultimately ends up saying. He's teaching like Jesus ends up teaching. He's telling people to repent of their sins, right? And get baptized. And so it's, it's not by chance that people are coming to the conclusion in verse 15, they're in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, right? So in John 1.35, he's got disciples. Those verses, those passages I just referred to seem to say the southern half, Judea and all Jerusalem, which is all in the southern half of the country, were going out to him. But in reality, what do we see in John? We see some disciples following John the Baptist around. They're the ones that end up following Jesus when he says, behold the lamb. Who are these people? Well, they are Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and unnamed, but our author, John, more than likely is the other one. So John, our author, and Andrew are disciples of John the Baptist. Peter, who gets renamed Peter, is likely a disciple as well because as soon as Andrew sees Jesus, he goes and gets Peter and it's the same day. And they're down south and Peter's not up and fishing. Peter's down with them. He goes and gets them and brings them. So likely Peter's a disciple as well. The only person in the, the group of four, two sets of brothers, is James. He's not mentioned. He's probably a disciple as well, but he's probably up fishing because somebody's got to call down the fort, right? Or everybody else is following the crazy guy in the wilderness. So, uh, who else? Well, Philip is mentioned. Philip is from uh, a town. All these others, they're from a town called Bethsaida. It's at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. They're down by the Dead Sea, more than likely, tradition would say, they're down by the Dead Sea at the place where John is baptizing. They're way far away. It's, it's nowhere near the northern region. In fact, at the end of John chapter 1, uh, near the end, when he starts collecting his disciples, Jesus gets it in his head that he's going to go up to the Galilee. And he ends up in Cana, which is up in the Galilee by Nazareth. But he has to get it in his head that they're going there because they're not there already, right? So all these people from the north are also down, not just listening to him, but they're his disciples. John the Baptist has huge momentum. And not only that, but if his, if his ministry lasted more than just a few months, let's say a year, maybe a year and a half, what he's doing is he's also hitting these festival cycles that the Jews had on their calendar. Three of them every year saw a huge influx of Jewish people to the, the city of Jerusalem, where the population would swell to well over a million or more. And during those times, you can be sure what's the city talking about. There's this guy. You got to go. And so people coming to Jerusalem for the feast would go out to see John the Baptist, to hear him, likely become baptized by him if they're true believers, right? Get baptized, confess their sin, go back to Jerusalem, give their offering for the festival, and where do they go now? They head back home. And even though people tried to get to Jerusalem three times a year, if you're coming from Ephesus, that's a long trip 
you're likely to make that sometimes once in your lifetime, sometimes once every so many years, but it's not a trip you make three times a year, more than likely, unless you've got a little bit of cash and can spend half your year away from whatever it is you do. So, why do I mention all of this? John the Baptist, huge following, huge momentum. He's the first one on the scene. People have high expectations of him. And there's a couple instances in the book of Acts that I'm going to take you to, and then we'll close. And uh, I haven't heard anybody do a sermon on these recently, but maybe I'll try it sometime. At the end of Acts chapter 18, um, you've got uh, a Jew by the name of Apollos. So I'm in verse 24 of chapter 18. A Jew named Apollos who is Alexandrian by birth, so Alexandria is in Egypt, so that's way south, okay? But he's an eloquent man, so he speaks well, and he came to Ephesus, right? And he was mighty in the scriptures. He knew his Old Testament well. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. This, this guy's a true believer, right? But let's find out more about him. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. Well, he even has some New Testament updates to the Old Testament scriptures, right? But he doesn't have all of it. What does it say? He's only acquainted with the baptism of John. You need to know in Acts chapter 18, we're likely 30 years after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. 30 years. Apollos from Alexandria was likely a person that went to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. Bit of conjecture here, but it, it fits the story. Likely goes to Jerusalem, hears about John the Baptist, goes out to the wilderness, gets baptized by John the Baptist, hears some of his teachings, maybe writes some of them down in his little notebook, goes back to Jerusalem, finishes the festival, and where is he off to? He's back home to Egypt. And then he starts, it seems, traveling around the world because he's an eloquent man, and he's teaching. He's teaching even about John the Baptist and Jesus, but he doesn't know anything past the ministry of John the Baptist's baptism. He doesn't know that there's something else. He missed the message that John said, it's not me, it's one who comes after me, whose sandal I'm not fit to untie, right? He missed that part of it. He got the name Jesus, but he has no idea of what's happened. This is 30 years later. And so what happens? Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. What did they explain to him? Oh, this Jesus guy, you've got to hear. You've got to hear the story. It's great. And what naturally happens when you hear the rest of the Jesus story? John the Baptist slips into the position that he was intended to be in all along as a precursor. And all of a sudden, as he goes on his way, he's not talking about John the Baptist quite as much, is he? But he's talking about Jesus more and more, which is exactly what John the Baptist intended. And then, right after that, Paul goes to Ephesus. And it happened while Apollos goes to Corinth now, that guy from the previous. Paul passes through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Well, this is interesting. And he said to them, Do you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no. We have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Unfortunate translation is probably better translated. Uh, we have not heard that the Holy Spirit has come or that he is. Okay. And Paul says, into what then were you baptized? If you don't know about the Holy Spirit coming, Pentecost is what he's referring to, Right. Acts chapter 2, what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. And they said, yes, of course, we know that. Telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is in Jesus. And they said, oh, oh, do I feel stupid? Because <laughs> for the last 30 years, and I'm, you know, we've been pretty good at what we do. For the last 30 years, we've really been promoting this guy, John the Baptist. And everything that he taught, wow. 
Okay, what should we do? Well, get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they did, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. This is one of the few instances where people speak in tongues. Yeah, one of the very few. So, you get these two little pockets in 18 and 19 of Acts, which suggests that even 30 years later, there's these little pockets, theological pockets, where people haven't heard the update about what Jesus did, but they've gotten part of the package. And now if we slip into the first chapter of John, if I know that all of this is happening in Ephesus, and I know John the author spends time in Ephesus, and I know Heraclitus was from Ephesus, and I look at John chapter 1, Things are making more sense why after verse 5 we slip into this little dialogue about who John the Baptist is. And then it seems like we're getting back to Jesus, but then we go back to John the Baptist saying, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not that. And then it totally makes sense that John the Baptist has some disciples and we see John the disciple writing in his gospel, see how John the Baptist told his disciples to go follow Jesus? See, that's why John was here. Because there were still people following John the Baptist, little pockets of John the Baptist followers. Does that make sense? It's the great invitation, chapter 1. It's the great invitation. And John was writing it to encourage several different groups of people that needed to hear the truth about who Jesus was, needed to understand that truth within a form and a concept that they already had in place, whether that be a Jewish one or a Gentile one or a Hellenistic understanding of both, or maybe I was stunted with John the Baptist's teachings and I never got the full meal deal. John says, come one and come all. I'm trying to get your attention in chapter one. And I want you to hear the greatest story ever told. And how I'm going to finish tonight is, uh, just to mention, I think it's necessary to point out, John's version of the calling of the first disciples. You've got Peter and Andrew and John. A lot of times we like to think that the gospel accounts of the calling of the first disciples was their first encounter with Jesus. Remember the ones up in the Sea of Galilee where they're fishing or they're tending their nets and Jesus walks by on the shore and they say, he says, follow me. And they just drop everything right then and there, which never really made sense to me because that's not the way it works in real life. Although it may sound like a great thing to live up to. We need to understand that the first calling of the disciples was in the wilderness when the disciples of John the Baptist from the north region were down there and John the Baptist said, go follow this guy because everything I'm saying, it's to point to him. And they said, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come, I'll show you. And they get to know and Peter gets a new name. So by the time Jesus walks by them and their boat on the shore, this isn't a first encounter. This is probably months later. They know exactly who he is. They may be scared to leave everything because that's realistic. But the picture of the calling of the disciples, I'd like to think is maybe even the way he calls us today. Uh, That he gives us a chance to be introduced to some of his concepts and see if they ring true in life. And then we dive in a little bit further and maybe we follow him and get to know him a little bit more. And at some point, yeah, At some point, there's the, hey, it's time to leave your boat. It's time to come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But that's not the first call that we see in scripture. It's not the first call. And I'd like to think that it's the same Jesus that calls us today. So my question, the way I want to leave you tonight is, how is the invitation for you? Are you leaving chapter one thinking to yourself, wow, I'd, I'm intrigued. My interest is piqued. And I am interested in reading the rest of this. Or maybe you've 
been hanging out with some of his sayings and we've been testing the waters and maybe it's time to listen to another call, right? As he calls you further into ministry. What is it that God would call you to? Call you to leave, to follow him. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for uh, this book of John. Thanks how different it is from the other Gospels, and yet how very similar it is. And God, thanks for the message that it brings, the message that you have been from the beginning, that you created all things, and that you humbled yourself enough to come and tabernacle among us. Thank you so much for doing that. Give us the strength and courage to follow you into this gospel and see if we can come out the other side. In Jesus' name, amen.